Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Sako Factory in Rihimaki, Finland. Uh, this year, 2021, is the 100th anniversary of the company's founding, and they were generous enough to open up their reference collection and let me film some of their very cool, uh, unique Finnish historical firearms. What we have here today is a model of 1954 Palo rifle. This is a short recoil operated, sort of flapper locked, uh, semi-automatic rifle. And it was developed by one Captain Carl Palo, and he actually did his developmental work on this rifle in the 1930s. But he couldn't get the Finnish military to seriously look at it until the 1950s, after World War II had ended. So our story for today begins in 1920. Carl Palo uh, joins the Finnish army, and he actually ends up going to cadet school and is promoted by the time he retires in 1926 to the rank of captain. Uh, hence you'll always see him referred to as Captain Carl Palo. That's why. However, he didn't stay that long in the army. He wasn't a career soldier. He left the army, he went and studied engineering, and in 1930 he started working at the Sako factory. It was during that time that he started developing uh, semi-automatic rifle actions. He was a big believer in the concept. The problem was the army wasn't necessarily all that super excited about semi-automatic rifles at the time. This sort of thing is expensive. Uh, the Finnish defense forces have always had uh, a tight budget. And this was compounded by the fact that Palo wasn't a serving military man, and it's, it appears that he was really trying to like bypass the military institutions and go directly to high officials in the Finnish government. When he first demonstrated his rifle, he did so in a fairly flamboyant uh, manner to an audience that included uh, the president of Finland, the uh, defense minister, uh, Marshal Mannerheim, and a few other high officials in the Finnish government. And while they may or may not have been impressed, bypassing the whole structure of you know, the, the military ordnance department isn't generally a great idea for trying to get your stuff adopted. Um, there are lots of parallels to that in other countries as well. So nothing comes of these designs by the time the Winter War happens. Well, once the Winter War happens, in, between the Winter War and the Continuation War, the interest in semi-automatic rifles really spikes up. Uh, so the Finns are working with some captured SVT uh, Tokarev rifles, and there's there's a sudden willingness to work with Palo and see if any of his designs can be put into military service, but it's, it's, it can't happen in time. Uh, the continuation war breaks out too quickly. Again, nothing comes of Palo's work until the 1950s. And once again, uh, Finland is in now a position of rearming itself, and by the 1950s it's very clear that semi-automatic rifles are the way of the future. So they're going to need something. And the Finnish government puts together some trials in the, in the early and mid-1950s testing uh, Palo's designs against the um, basically a, a Finnish modified version of the SVT-38, uh, the Tokarev SVT-40. So uh, while the base concept was developed in the 1930s, this rifle was actually manufactured in 1954 by Sako. Um, there is a 1956-57 pattern as well that is a little bit different that was developed by Sako and Palo together, and those three rifles would be tested. So uh, before we talk about how the, those tests ended up, let's take a closer look at this. Let me show you how this rather funky thing works. Normally with a rifle like this we would start by taking a look at the markings, however there are no markings on this, uh, not even a serial number as far as I've been able to find. So what we have here fundamentally is a semi-automatic rifle, has a fixed 10 round magazine chambered for 762 by 54 rimmed, or 53 rimmed in Finnish terminology. It appears to have been made based on a Lee Enfield magazine, which fits. Um, the follower's been uh, modified a bit as has the magazine body to fit the uh, well the case dimensions of 762 by 54 but this is a magazine that was designed for a rimmed cartridge and so not a bad magazine to choose when you're modifying something for another rimmed cartridge all of the machining on here is really quite beautifully done we have a round fully hooded front sight with just a standard round post inside 
we have a clue here that this is a recoil operated rifle from this wear pattern, uh, because when this fires, the barrel reciprocates into the action just that far. That's maybe 12 or 15 centimeters, about half an inch. At the back end we have a simple sheet metal butt plate. Um, there was originally a sling bar that fitted right here, held in place with a bolt on the other side. Uh, it would have matched the pattern of this front sling bar, but it's missing now. The rear sight is an aperture style right there, so it's screw adjustable for windage, and then you can squeeze these two spring-loaded buttons in and raise or lower it for elevation. And then this lever back here is our disassembly lever. All right, I'm going to disassemble this first and then show you how it works because um, it, this is actually missing the recoil spring, and like many recoil operated rifles it's a little bit funky to work with. So first we're going to pull this lever off to the right. That will unlock the rear section of the receiver cover, and I can then pull this forward and lift it up and out. We have a pair of buffer springs here that will cushion the impact of the bolt and barrel, and normally this rod would have the recoil spring on it, but like I said, the recoil spring is missing. Now with that out, I can take off what is normally the dust cover and charging handle. Obviously there's the charging handle. This has a lug at the front with a little hole in it that would normally lock into this spot in the bolt. The recoil spring is nested inside this part of the bolt and holds this thing in place. Now we're going to pull the barrel back as if it was recoiling, and then pop, pull the bolt back, and the bolt, once the barrel is forward I can lift the bolt up and pull it out of the action. Now while we've got all these bits removed you can see the original, the remains of the Enfield follower in there. You can see that this has a stripper clip guide, so this would be reloaded by a pair of stripper clips. And then there are a pair of lugs right here, and these are, are very significant. Um, this front lug, when the bolt hits it, it gets pushed in and it unlocks the barrel assembly and allows the barrel assembly to return forward. When it does that, this lug is actually locked into the side of the bolt right here, and so uh, that helps keep the two together. That's not actually the locking system. Um, but that helps keep these two together while they're opening. So you can see when the, the barrel comes to full travel it unlocks that. Uh, it, that drops into the side of the receiver, comes out of this, and allows the bolt to travel backwards. Now what's actually locking this thing are basically Degterev style flaps. So Instead of being free moving, like on the Degterev, there are a pair of little flat springs that hold them in place, but there are two little pins here that open up two flaps on the rear of the bolt, like that. If I can do this where you can see them. There we go. And I can pull them out from under the springs too. So they lift out like that, and when they are out they lock into a pair of recesses that you can just barely see right there. In essence the bolt is locking into this chunk of metal back here. So when the barrel and this piece recoil um, upon firing the bolt is locked in battery in there. You can actually see the two sets of tracks right here that these little pins run in. Man, this thing is full of difficult camera angles, but if you see right there and right there above my finger, uh, the two tracks open up, and that is where the flaps are forced to open and lock into the walls of the receiver here, or the barrel extension. Unfortunately, the way this thing is manufactured, which is by the way very expensive, um, precludes me from having any way to show you those locking flaps actually coming out. But 
Um, what I can show you once again are we have our two cams up here. So the front cam releases the barrel to go back, which pushes this lug in. That lug would lock into the barrel, so or the bolt. So the bolt can't go forward unless this is back, which allows that to go forward, and then the whole assembly can be pushed into battery, like so. And once more with the weird camera angles, this is hammer fired. So once that bolt goes all the way into battery, there is a hammer here that lifts up out of the bottom of the action in that slot and hits the firing pin to actually fire it. In its 1950s testing, Palo's rifles actually did fairly well, which is, to be honest, a little bit of a surprise to me. Um, recoil operated shoulder rifles have never been particularly successful, and no disrespect to Palo, I don't think this one would have been either had it actually been put into service, even with some refinements for military practicality. Um, the idea of the, the moving barrel in a shoulder rifle for the military just doesn't work all that well. Gas operating systems tend to be a much better solution. At any rate, the Palo never really had the opportunity to prove this out because while his guns did fairly well in trials, the whole program ended up uh, being cancelled because it was decided to go with a smaller intermediate cartridge instead. Uh, Finland saw well, during World War II, this originated with the Sturmgewehr and its 8x33 cartridge, and then of course the Soviet Union developing the Kalashnikov, well, the SKS, the RPD, the Kalashnikov, the whole series of, the whole family of rifles around the M43 cartridge, 7.62x39, and it would be that cartridge that Finland would end up adopting with its new self-loading military rifles, which would be of course the AK pattern, um, the RK60 and RK62 rifles. So uh, that left Palo kind of with nowhere to go. There wasn't a need for a self-loading rifle in 7.62x54, or 53 in Finnish terminology. And thus, um, the rifles end up as uh, very rare, um, low production historical curiosities like this one. So a big thanks to Sako for letting me pull this out of their reference, uh, reference museum and show it to you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.